So what I what we did was we actually took a big sample of this and gave it to a crowdsourced sanitation company and said, okay, how many of these are coherent? And my estimate was probably around like a tenth that weren't would get weird repetitions, but the rest were pretty solid. Humans, you know, thought these were decent good examples in, in general. So let's try another one chasing crabs in the road. <laughs> so if that's a little morbid, <laughs> results are not guaranteed. Okay. I just want to get this off on the right, right note. So I think this is a fun demo. And to me it's inspiring because natural language processing has come a long way. Have you, any of you seen the, the old articles where they're trying to generate some recurrent neural net models? They're okay. <laughs> they're, they're a little sketchy. Um, whereas, you know, these language models, now, there's a caveat. I mean, they look pretty good. There's a caveat, which is they're gigantic and it's really slow. So, without a GPU behind it and um, you know a lot of time to train the model, you're not going to get these kind of results. But there is some good news on that score, and that is that you don't have to. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So let's go back. Okay. So for for the business mind of the money, um, that was an interesting. Figures. I don't know, even know how they estimate these figures. So it suggested that um, the market value for natural language processing would be about 28.6 billion in 2026. I get a little suspicious when the numbers, the years, are farther out. I'm still a little more made up. Um, growth at 11.171 percent. But I think we see a lot of applications for this kind of technology, right? So a lot of things we can do with it. Okay. So what do I mean by natural language processing? What I mostly mean is not audio. <laughs> so let's probably distinguish ourselves within a uh, digital routine. We, um, you know, we have an audio team. They do audio, and a text team does text, which mostly for us means email and chat. So I threw up some some uh, Twitter and then answer reports. That's a popular one uh, in our healthcare group. Similarity is something else that you can do. So you can say, how similar is this text to that text? And in a large corpus of data, you can pull out examples and say, okay, well, this is like that. Or, you know, we take we take text search for or text similarity for granted somewhat because Google everything. I mean, they've got this nice similarity index, and you say if you say it one way or another, you kind of get the same result. They're actually pretty good at that. Um, recommendation systems we kind of take Amazon for granted too. Um, smart queries, it's where you, you've got a little more understanding about, you know, or it tries to understand, the machine tries to understand a little better what you mean instead of, okay, I've got to phrase this exactly right. Um, and then some more interesting things. We just saw a, a fun example of text generation. Machine translation, so we've all, uh, well, most of us have used Google Translate. Question answering is another thing that's popular in academics. Still doesn't work super great, but like all of these technologies, it's up and coming. It'll get there. Uh, Chatbots, um, and then reasoning. So trying to draw out facts from text and say, okay, put those together. This implies x implies y implies z. Therefore, x implies z. So doing that kind of reasoning. The basis is to get the facts out of um, out of your text first. Let's talk a little bit about what um, what's so interesting. Why deep learning? So I, I um, hastily <laughs> hastily created a, a topic for this uh, this presentation and um, or this tutorial, and I started thinking through. Okay, well, what is, I mean, deep learning is pretty broad, but what exactly would be useful for this crowd? So let's talk a little bit about what um, what is useful. I think transfer learning is what's made deep learning. Super powerful. Deep learning is caught on because um, because of image classification. That's really the, the big application that works well. Um, you know, you do a Google image search, all that stuff uh, pops up and it's real it's relevant. But that was actually you know you won't rewind some years to um, 2012. There was a big breakthrough. So there was a clever idea in the research world to create a data set, two data sets. One was called WordNet. WordNet has a list of relationships. So for example, um, a table is also a piece of furniture, which is also a thing. 
So there's this ontology of words, and they built this huge database. You can still download it, it's free. Um, of all kinds of concepts, how they're related to, you know, kind of the next more abstract con concept, and then on up. Well, somebody came up with a brilliant idea. Well, why don't we take that and make this massive image database? So what if we could collect 5,000 examples for every word in WordNet? So it just started, I think it was Princeton and Stanford that started this project, and they, you know, they just crowdsourced and collected, and it's been going on for a long time, and they're still collecting. But ImageNet um, has thousands and thousands of examples, and the beauty of it is that with words of what's in the image, you know, words are related to other words, so that you know, for example, this is an image of a chair, but it's also an image of furniture. I don't have to go figure that out or put that in, encode that in some way. So they had these shootouts every year where they would bring their most awesome models, train on ImageNet, and say, okay, who did the best? Well, there was a big jump in 2012 when, with a, a neural network by the name of AlexNet that used a um, convolutional network, which is a, a brand of deep, um, deep neural networks. And by deep, we just mean it has a lot of layers. So deep is bad. And so it did really well. It was a big jump in performance. Like, you want to look at the little curve, and there's this big jump in performance starting with 2012 and going on. So the, um, I think the competition has finally just been retired <laughs> because it's sort of no point now. But what's really cool for us is transfer learning. So not only did they create these models, you can download them easily for free, and you can take your own images, you can easily adapt that big model trained on lots and lots and lots of categories to your own data. There are easy tools to do that. Um, so if you want to jump down that, uh, or go down that rabbit hole, um, let me know and I can give you some pointers. But um, what does that matter for us? So last year-ish, um, that finally came to text. So um, two researchers, Jeremy Howard and Sebastian Ruder, and kind of simultaneously, the Allen AI Institute created a similar model for text where you can take a huge volume of text data and you train it on some unsupervised task. You say, okay, I, I want to I want to predict the next word in the sentence. Or like uh, Google does, I, I cross out some of the words in the sentence and see if I can fill in the blanks. And you just check to see how well your prediction does at filling in the blanks, whether it be the next word or word series. Train these big models, and then she demonstrated that you can use them to transfer you know, take a simple text example and create a reasonable classifier without a ton of data. And that's transfer learning for text. The other technology that made this feasible is uh, an architecture, a neural net architecture that came out of um, Google called the Transformer. And the idea there is instead of all these crazy uh, recurrent convolutional um, layers that had, were so successful in image classification, it created just uh, an attention layer. So it says, okay, which things are relevant in, this, in, in the words that I'm seeing? And then how do I predict the next layer? Okay, do some more attention, predict the next layer. Do some more attention, predict the next layer. So it's much simpler than what we've been using before. And that's what allows us to get to the point where now you can just pull up a library download Google or Facebook, I mean, they all have these big pre trained models, and get started building your own text classifier. So we're going to do that today. <coughs> Hopefully I don't talk too fast. <laughs> but, um, I, I think we'll, uh, we'll cover a lot of ground. Um, okay, so let's, that, that kind of makes sense. So this is where we're going today. Text transfer um, with Google Bird, which is their, their uh, famous model. They, these models are affectionately known as Muppet kind. Uh, the, the Allen AI Institute released Elmo. Um, Microsoft has one called Big Bird, and Google Bird is probably the most, uh, most used of the group. Okay, so then why? Why would I want to do this? Well, it makes things easier. So if you're a data scientist, um, 
you want to use deep learning because you don't want to spend a lot of time hand engineering features, trying combinations of features, and seeing what works. You want the network to learn all that for you. Give it some text, then go back and do your tuning, and let the whole thing be bundled up in the neural network. Let it learn everything. Um, transfer learning gets us up and running with less time and less data. Hopefully, if we're successful today, we'll demonstrate that. And then you can get a lot higher performance. So you're starting at a baseline, you know, with, with some traditional machine learning techniques, you're kind of tuning to get into a reasonable performance level. Whereas you can start pretty high with all this pre-trained data, you know, so many million web pages and Wikipedia entries that have been pre-trained into a model. And you're just fine-tuning it to, to fit your problem. What do you need? Um, what do you need to know? Some of the models are big and slow. That can be alleviated to some degree with GPUs. And it kind of depends on your application. If you're just doing research, you probably don't care. If you're running on millions and millions of emails a day, you definitely care. Um, sometimes you need more data when you're using deep learning. That kind of depends on the task you're doing. And you've got to know what you're doing, which I think kind of goes without saying in the machine learning world. OK, so let's talk classifiers. Now, I'm going to give an official disclaimer at this point. I'm not doing all data science for classifiers. If you want to build a good model for production, you've got to do a lot of things. You've got to do uh, model selection, figure out which model works best. You've got to do pre processing, have parameter optimization, evaluate things carefully, make sure that you have a good diversity of your data sets. And I'm not going to cover that today. There are fantastic tutorials, there are toolkits, there are tools you can get buy and or off the shelf to do all this for you. Plug in MLflow, for example. We used to experiment with MLflow Google this year. Um, Pachyderm. There are a bunch of things that will kind of set up that big info infrastructure for you, let you just try all the different things. What I want to talk to you about today is just something I hope is useful for you. If you're thinking about, do I want to use this on a problem that I have, what things do I need to know that are unique to this way of using deep learning models. So the question is, what, um, what do I need to know? So things I want to talk about, how to think about it. There are only a few parameters that are really crucial. And so we're going to fiddle with those some today. How to get set up quickly, make sure you're on the right track. <laughs> Before you commit your model out to, say, you know, MLflow or another uh, tool that's going to optimize it over, you know, in dimensions, and you're going to spend a lot of money and time, make sure you're on the right track. So if there's one thing you can walk away with today, I hope, it's start small and build up. Um, I don't take credit for that. My uh, my boss, uh, Uday Kamas, at Visual Reading, is always cracking to make sure it works <laughs> and then scale up. So if you don't take anything else away from that today, please do that. And what I'm usually working toward is just a prototype. So we need a prototype for X. Let's try this out. Let's get something working quickly. Um, bosses like that. So we're going we're gonna to focus on that. Caveat. For this example, I use Bert SK Learn, and I, I regret it. I'm going to say that right here now. And I'll tell you why. It has some limitations. The API is super easy to follow, and that's why I leaned into that, because I thought it will be super easy to follow the code. I'm not sure about the code. Uh, you know, friendliness of the audience ahead of time. Um, but it keeps me from doing a couple of things. And so I'm a little bit annoyed, but you'll see. And what I would like to do, and I actually have already done some of the notebook stuff in PyTorch Transformers, which is nice, but it exposes more of the wiring. So you have to you have to kind of fiddle with some things yourself, make sure that you're, and, and that's the good thing and the bad thing. The bad thing is you have to keep track of more detail. The good thing is you can fix things if they don't quite work the way you want. So one of my uh, beats with Bird SK Learn is that it gives you a nice parameter to pick and say, OK, well, I want this percentage of my training data to be saved on for validation. Well, it doesn't give you any control over how to select that data. It just does it. So as I found in one example, it does it in a bad way. <laughs> I had to figure out a way to, you know, I didn't want to dig in and change the code for everybody. but. Um, I had to figure out a way to kind of work around that. Um, let's see. 
And so that Pyperx transform is great. The other reason it's great is because um, there was this company, it's almost funny to say, there was this company in Hugging Face that <laughs> puts together these open source tools for using these big transfer models, and they have all of them. So as soon as something comes out of one of the big, you know, Google or Facebook or whoever, they've got an implementation. I mean, it's usually within a day or two. And I've just been really amazed. They turn these things around super quickly. So um, I can make that available. I have not made it available. Um, okay, so I think I've done the disclaimers. If you're just here for, you know, data science, uh, how to optimize a model, I didn't do that. I'm sorry. You still, another, you still have time to start another session, step out if you wish. But um, otherwise, we're we're going to jump in and do crazy stuff. Um, let's see. Let's see. Okay, recipes. If you want a deep learning text classifier, you need data, you need labels, you need a pre-trained model, you need to pick some parameters, and of course you need a computer. So I made the baseline assumption that we would all have laptops and probably not a GPU. So these are gonna take a little time to run. Not super long, but if you have a GPU, you can do this in minutes. Things you need to do, clean up your data, subdivide it, I did the data cleaning up for you. Don't worry about it. I can make that code available if you want to. But I will tell you, don't spend a lot of time cleaning up your text. There's a fantastic library called um, STFY. Uh, I forgot what it means. Take that for you? Yeah, take that for you. Thank you. And it's great. Run your initial parameters and then iterate. So why was the why do we start small? Here's why we start small. Iterating. You're going to iterate this model a lot of times because it's not going to work right. It's not going to do what you expected it to do. And if your iteration time is long, then your development time is long. If your iteration time is small, then you're, you'll get where you want to go quickly. But you've got to not shoot yourself in the foot. It's kind of a balance. If you put too little data in it, for example, you won't get anything meaningful other than I can run data from the input to the output, which is useful, but you want to get past that one pretty fast. And then you want to deploy it somewhere. I'm not going to cover that today either. Okay, what data am I using? Crowdflower, now figure eight, uh, created a set of tweets which um, talk about iPhones, iPads, and Android devices, and they're labeled as sentiment, positive, negative, neutral. I think we have more seating up front here if anybody wants to pull up. Feel free to march out and uh, disrupt. I'm good with that. Also, Feel free to make this interactive. If you have questions, if you're stuck on something, let's talk about it. Um, if it's downloading, I cannot help you. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, okay, so this one, 8,000 examples, quality's good. I, I really liked the, I felt like they tagged it well, and you can get it here. Uh, also in the repo, just pull it. Um, Kaggle Sentiment 140. I have a version in there, I think I'm allowed to really read some, I'm not, I should be distributing it. Go get some Kaggle yourself if you need to use it for anything other than this tutorial today. I'll probably take it off the repo uh, shortly. But um, what that one is, it's useful because it's also tweets with sentiment labels, and there are 1.6 million examples. They're only positive or negative. There wasn't anything labeled as neutral, and quality isn't that great. I looked at it and was kind of, you know, always read your data. That, okay, that's lecture lesson number two. Always read your text. You're working with text. It's easy to read. Read it. You read some of it and you go, oh, that's not right. You very quickly find, when you download public data, public text data sets, excuse me, um, that a lot of it isn't right. And then you get really frustrated. You, you don't want to be down, you know, five model iterations later going, why am I getting terrible scores? Well, because the data is badly labeled. So look at your data. Read your data. Get comfortable with your data. Okay. So we'll start with problem one, overfitting. Um, did anybody, okay, is anybody trying to actually do this and has gotten as far as like trying what was in there, the, according to the instructions and the reading? Got one here. Awesome. Two, okay, good, good. Did you get as far as like doing the fit and pulling the model? It's, uh, yeah, it's right now. Okay, good, good. That's going to take a while, but that's okay. Um, okay, overfitting. If you already know overfitting, you can go to the now too. You're all good. <laughs> but, but this is important, and this, this one is super important for a deep learning model. You have a model that has billions of parameters. Well, millions or billions. 
A few of them have billions, most of them have hundreds of millions. And you can literally put any amount of data in there and it will memorize it. We'll do a great job of it. So you've got to do some you gotta do some very good diligence on this one dimension of the problem because these models are so good at learning what you put in there. And of course you don't want to build a model that just memorizes your input and gives your output accordingly. You want to actually generalize the problem and the data that it hasn't seen before. So let's do a quick tutorial on overfitting and we'll get, I promise you, we're gonna to get to the nitty-gritty graph. Oh, it is. Okay. I think it was in the conference info. Like when yeah, there's like, profile. yeah, there's like a downloadable thing. And you can just pull that. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. It's quick, quick overfitting. I have to separate things to points. I can use a very general curve, or I can use a very specific curve that captures every little variation and does a really good job. Obviously. If I want to use this in the future, I want to use something a little more general. So, like the same thing here, I've got this general linear trend line. That's probably the better thing to learn because the problem yours carefully fits every point. And you don't want to do that, and here's why. So, if I assume that I use this blue polynomial curve, it 100% fit all the points. But what happens when I see new points that I haven't seen before? Well, what happens is I miss. So you can see this point here completely missed, 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 but they're closer to the trend line. They're kind of within the noise that you would have expected when you, um, you know, when you saw the original data. So you want to use the simplest model you can get away with, which is kind of a contradiction to what I just said before. We're going to use a 600 million parameter model to learn your few hundred text examples, which is why you have to be careful. <laughs> you don't want to just do the, the easy and easy thing. So the whole point, the whole point of machine learning is to create a representation that generalizes to new examples that haven't been seen. So you've got to test yourself. So how are we going to do this? Um, we use holdout tests. But you want to be careful with that too. Remember that every piece of test data, a holdout test is a set of data you've kept back, you haven't trained on it at all, and you use it for evaluation. But every piece of test data can be used either for optimization or evaluation, but not both. So your temptation is, I ran my data set, I scored it on my holdout, and then I want to go back and make it better. You should not do that. <laughs> the proper way to do this is two holdout sets. So you use a validation set locally that you, use, you, can, you don't necessarily dig into it, but you can try to improve against that validation set. When you're done, only when you're done, go to your real holdout and score the set and say, okay, here's how we did it. Those things will tell you something. They'll tell you how well you're generalizing to um, the models you have seen for. Yes, sir? So is there any support for you service? Like, when I have all these slides, and it's before you take it to zero, but since you have the full-time evaluation, is there any support for you? Yeah. So it really depends on the balance of your data. If you have very few positives, for example, it's really hard to split. Um, and say, okay, I need to make three you know, equally distributed sets. The ideal is you want three sets that are fairly comfortable, like you cover enough variation and have the same distribution of, of parameters. But you can't always get that. So sometimes it's a little bit an awful, and I'll show you here kind of what happens with these big models when, you, when you're a little bit off. Um, so it, I mean, unfortunately it's a little bit about experience, but there's some great questions and answers on like stack exchange. People answer these kinds of questions all the time, and they're very precise. I found that to be a great group. They, um, they really covered things well. And as a teaser, I'll give you two Stack Exchange uh, links for free. <laughs> How is cross validation different from data snooping? And general strategy for tuning on machine learning algorithms. Both of those are, are exceptional. Question. So for uh, so for example, your hypothesis How is that? Right, so. So ultimately, you've got to have some way to. Um, you've got to have some way to do both if you're going to optimize your model. If you're going to say, look, I'm going to build this model and I don't care how well it runs, 
then, then you know you don't have to do that. But if you're going to optimize, you've got to have optimization, and you've got to be able to say, here's how well the model does. And one of the things I find useful, this is probably a little farther down the road, is create some awesome, like, and this is great for text. This is why I love text, right? To find more data. You can go download stuff from the internet. You can run GPT-2 for an hour and create 100,000 examples. Um, so what, what, you know, one trick we use is like take some of our positive, run GPT-2 to create continuations that some are right, some wrong, and tag those and see how well they do. So then you've got some more data, and you've got another holdout that's a little bit different, and you get you some diagnostics. You're like, oh, it doesn't do well on that, you know? Or like we'll create subtle language variations and say, okay, look, I've got um, I've got this test set, but it came from my original. You know, like we use them a lot. I split in on a bunch of times. So we've got a lot of data, but there are very few positives for what we're looking for. So then I'll go and say, okay, we'll take some of the positives I do have from training and rephrase them. Rephrasing is super easy. Sit down and rephrase them yourself and say, okay, hold those out. See how I do on rephrasing. You'll find you probably don't do that great. <laughs> but it's a great way to make test sets for text. So download things, make things up yourself. Text is easy, it's fun. Um, if you don't like text, you're probably in the wrong tutorial. Okay. So then the question, which you're going to see here in a minute, why are you snooping in your notebook? The answer is, I want to snooping a little. No, the reason is, I'm piloting. I am deliberately choosing a very, very small random sample of the data to see if the model is on the right track. I'm not optimizing a big model, I'm not getting it ready for production, I'm just trying to make sure I'm doing this right. So I do a little bit of snooping, I'll show you how and why. I'm not like digging in and fixing particular bugs based on what's in the holdout, but I, anyway, I'll show you, I'll show you the how and why. So, fear not, because that will come up. You'll be looking at my notebook and you'll go, why is he snooping, he just told me not to. Okay, learning curves. So this is probably the most useful tool with your deep learning model. Learning curves are fantastic. You just take the loss parameter that comes with from your training set and your validation set as you run them together, and then you, you just plot them against each other. And what you're looking for is the point where, since you're not training on the validation, this is the red one here. Sorry, anyone colorblind is pulling with the knife. Um, you're looking for the point where it starts to kind of go back up. You're saying it's not generalizing anymore. And I probably took this. I probably stopped this a little too early because sometimes it will bump back up. And so. I just want you to see a curve that goes back up. Um, so the idea then is the validation set's telling you something, at least it's the first cut, uh, first pass of, is this generalizing? And if it's not, if it's starting to get worse, then I'm probably not generalizing anymore. I'm starting to overfit. I mean, this, the training set, or the model has learned from the training set too many very specific patterns, and it's, it's not even going to work on something that's very similar to the training set, because it drew the validation set also from the same data. Um, and then I did some accuracy here. So the, yeah, you can see like, I did two points here. So I, like after four uh, iterations, I, I did one test to val, and that's what I'm talking about. Thinking. I did actually do this part, part way through. But it's just for illustration for you and for me, kind of how to troubleshoot models. Um, and you can see, though, the, the validation accuracy up to that last point is actually getting better the whole time. So we're, we're still good. We're, we're making a good model here. Now, what's a good heuristic for, I'm using a transfer learning model. How many iterations should I have to run to get a decent model? Someone want to guess? I'd say three or four. You see, sometimes people mention an article. I ran 300 epochs on the Earth while of the learning rate. <laughs> okay, we will talk about that. <laughs> Hyperparameters. <laughs> um, okay, here are a few of them. So, which model do you use? Usually, in these, whether it's Piper transformers or Bert SKLearn, they all just use these strings. And you say, okay, I want to use Bert based on case, which is regular size Bert, not the big one. And no, and just lowercase everything. I don't, I don't want to care about case. Um, I just picked that one. There was no deep motivation other than, yeah, that should work. Um, and because I think this is my hypothesis, which I didn't validate. In Twitter data, probably case isn't that strong of an indicator of anything. So it's not like I'm looking at stock tickers or it's Twitter. 
Anyway, so um, max sequence length. So what it's going to do is take the number of words you give it and it's going to truncate it to that number. This is, uh, oh, I guess I'll come back to that in just a second. Learning rate, we'll talk about in a second. Epoch, how many times you iterate. Batch size, now this is when you're starting to say, okay, I want to put this on a GPU or something. How many examples to cram in there at once? Um, vocabulary size, so you're gonna, it's gonna pick ahead of time. This, these are the words that I can, that I recognize. Everything else gets ignored. Sort of, with BERT you get like subwords and anyway, it's got a, it's got a clever way of doing all that stuff. But it limits the vocabulary, and that's good for you because if it didn't limit the vocabulary, you'd have to put the model running forever and ever and ever. And then some other things, like number of hidden layers, hidden dropout, don't change the number of hidden layers. Probably don't play with the dropout either, that's been changing pretty well. Dropout's just a regularization technique that says, okay, as I'm trying to learn, I'm going to randomly set some of the uh, weights in the model, in the network, to zero, to force the, to force the, the learning algorithm to try to overcome basically the unreliable neural network. So that, that keeps it from memorizing things. It'll say, okay, I can just encode this pattern here and this pattern here, and it comes back on the next path like, wait, that, that's not the way that I put here before. Yeah, I've got to come up with something else. And so it, all the regularization techniques help you um, generalize better. So you're not going to learn that exact specific pattern of, um, of words and characters that you learned before and um, get yourself in control. Okay, so that's just a fun thing. So, if you had to get, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. So yeah, there's, there's a domain adaptation step. There are two publicly available um, BERT models. One is CyBERT and the other is BioBERT, I think, anyway. They've already been trained on and, and adapted. And there's a whole set of tools. The PyTorch Transformer um, repo has a script. You say, okay, I've got this uh, unlabeled data for this domain. Pre yeah, do another pre-training pass on this data. And now I've got a, ver a model that's adapted to that domain. So that's straightforward. And I would have loved to show that, but it, you know, I had one I was having technical problems, so I didn't get to it. Two, I realized it was going to take forever to actually run that and try to do it here. You know, so um, I would love to have brought along a kind of an ad adapted model to show the difference, but um, I didn't get to it. I cut scope a little to get to this uh, down the door. Um, okay, so let's let's continue. If you had to pick hyperparameters, if I just had one, if I only allowed to turn one knob, what is the knob to turn? <clears throat> Batch size is good. Uh, you're going to evaluate larger or smaller sets at a time. It takes some time, right. and you'll get different So that's true. So anyway, ten years. One because you already mentioned it. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> Two because it Theoretically helps you get to the ideal result faster. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna actually pick three. <laughs> um, these two because this kind of fits you to your your hardware. You say okay, this is what I can run in the time and hardware I have available. And yeah, you want to use the biggest batch size you can. Usually, you can find some papers that say otherwise for particular things. But use the biggest batch size and sequence length that you can get away with. Now, if you know Twitter, you have a fixed number of Characters, right? So you're not going to usually have 512 words in a Twitter in a tweet. So you can get away with a much smaller uh, sequence length. The batch size is also important, like I said. And then, of course, and this is all because training time is precious. So how do we make sure make best use of our training time? I said this twice. I'll say it again. <laughs> Start with a small subset of your data. Make sure all the steps run with small data, then step up to larger data. Not large data, larger data. So the time you invest, it feels frustrating because you're like, okay, I'm just doing these iterations, I'm not getting anywhere, I'm not training my real model, but you waste so much more time trying to tune and get your model working on the whole thing. 
Okay, I blew three hours and then it got to the end and it crashed on the eval step. I had nothing to show for it. So if I run it with 100 samples, made sure that it actually ran, okay, that would be great. Now, I, you know, you, you find all these funny little things. Um, number four, use a GPU. If you have one, great. Apple says, most of you know, don't have useful GPUs for this kind of stuff, which is really sad because I like them. But um, cloud GPUs, which are fine if you remember to turn them off when you're done. Otherwise, you get a big bill from Amazon or Google. And then the cool one, does anyone use Google Colab? Love Google Colab. So I did some of these examples actually on Google Colab and ported my code back to something I could run on a laptop. So I will actually put the Colab notebooks out there too. Um, so much faster you like two minutes later you got your thing. So Google makes available for free, for those of you who don't know, notebooks that run on their hardware and you get a 12 hour cycle. So you you know you do a little bit of fiddling, you get your data onto it and run your model, and then 12 hours later it recycles the VM that it's running on, but you can save all your stuff into your Google Drive, you know, so if you're really smart about saving your checkpoints and so forth, you can just restart it on the next VM and it's great. It's free. Did I say that? It's free. Just use it. It's really awesome. It's a little quirky because if you try to do some of the things like fast.ai, somebody talked about that, and I'll probably mention that many more times, because if you're serious about deep learning, and learning how to do neural nets, you should be doing the fast audio of course. Everything else is pales in comparison. And you should not watch the course. Do it. Build the models. You will be awesome. That's, I mean, there's just no question. They're the best. Um, so, okay, Google Collaboratory. So, sorry, I'm connecting A and B. Google Collaboratory is a little bit annoying with Fast.ai because it's very nicely set up. Then they have this cool thing in Fast.ai for selecting your own like images and things. It doesn't work in Google Collab. That's okay. You can work around that. But um, anyway, Google Collab. Thumbs up. Okay. Yeah, this is Google Collab. So here's my Fast.ai. Uh, I found that free flowers data set and classifying British flowers. And then, you know, this is the Collab notebook and you can see for the bad, these are the bad examples that were misclassified and the attention, like, it's not looking at the flower part at all, it's looking over here at some random thing. This one also missed some of the important features, so you kind of see how that's working. Um, then I tried to do a cool, a cooler model with, uh, with spaceships from Star Trek, but the data is still really messy, so I don't count that part. <laughs> I mean, What's more useful to you in your daily life? Classifying spaceships or flowers? <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then learning rate. I would say definitely, I would agree with them. Learning rate, thumbs up. So, we're gonna talk a lot about learning rate. Um, how fast to step the optimization? And why is that important? Because either you're going to take a very, very, very long time to get there, if you set it too small, or you're never going to get there if you set it too large. Everyone clear on that? Okay, we can move on. Um, so you you want to just you want to have something that kind of makes the and, and this is this is the black magic of uh, of machine learning or deep learning because you kind of got to learn how to do it. Now, fast.ai has a great utility to help you bound your window. So I'm not going to show that. And say go do the class. It's in lesson one. You'll learn how to bound learning rates in lesson one. Fast.ai is practical deep learning for coders, version three. Please make sure it goes version three. I did version two and it was pain. <laughs> um, okay, here we go. Let's talk about classifiers. Let's look at it. Product sentiment data imbalance. So for those of you who tried to run this, don't run this one right now, please. I'm just going to show you what kind of walk through, do a little bit of 
how to troubleshoot things and why, and then we'll actually do the real thing. Um, okay, so load some data, and I'll follow that. Do a split. I didn't use, I copied somebody's code, so I just used their split. My other notebook actually uses a proper stratified split, but I did check it. <laughs> so if you don't do it, don't, if you don't use SK Learn and stratify your split correctly, then at least check and make sure your training and test distributions are comparable. These are a few percentage points off, but they're not fully. So I just looked at it. Um, all right. So then start small. Down sample of the test, training test test, 800 and 500. Run everything, or set everything up. Make sure that I'm still, I still have a pretty reasonable, and I, I got a little bigger gap here on the zero, um, the neutral class. Fire up the bird classifier, and you can see I'm choosing bird base, uncased, the default parameter. And one of the things I did like about SKLearn is you print your model, and you can see all your parameters. I think Piper um, transforms those up too. See all the things. Learning rate, put the default. Didn't want to mess with that until I knew better. And then um, run the model. So this is the part that will take you the first time you run a model about fit. It'll actually download the whole bird base uncased, a couple of gigs. And then once you have it, though, it's in your directory. The other thing I don't like, though, this is warning, warning to all. The other thing I don't like about Bert SK Learn is that it caches the model locally on your disk. And so when you fire up a second notebook and start running it, it's actually overriding your first model. Be careful. <laughs> so only run one model at a time. And um, I won't tell you how I found that out. <laughs> so, um, so I run the, the model, and Actually, like I said, I, I snooped a little bit. So I did run my test set. And the reason I snooped a little bit is because I'm going to blame it totally 100% on bird SK learning. So you see here when I start to run, so it's trained data size here, and the default was 10%. It's right there, validation fraction 10%. So it pulls out 80 samples, and I started to get a little suspicious of that one. And runs them through, and you see it looks like it's getting better. Like, okay, yeah, 70%. I'm good with that. And then I run the, the test uh, accuracy, and it's still like 70-ish percent. So I'll kind of stay here, like, okay, well, we're doing well. We're still improving. So let's run it some more. So I ran a few more cycles. Um, ran four more cycles. And you can see here, the, so the numbers I'm looking at here are train loss, validation loss, validation accuracy. So it looks like validation accuracy is getting really good. Numbers are still going down until this point. And it kind of bounces down again, so maybe I'm okay. But this didn't budge. It makes me really suspicious. So um, I said, okay, let's do some diagnostics. Let's go back to my presentation. Why don't we use accuracy when we, when we are testing these things? We do use accuracy. Why don't we stick with it? What's missing? Look at this example. So I build a classifier, binary classifier, yes, no. I get 80% accuracy, looks fantastic. But the data is in balance. So I already have 88% positive in the data. So if I just said yes every time, I can increase my accuracy by 8%. I have a, a, a no-op uh, machine learning model. So be careful. So what do we use instead? We use precision and recall. Um, Wikipedia, I have to say, still has some of the best explanations on this thing. Um, Precision and recall, you can kind of tell recall of all samples that are positive, what fraction did the model find, those ones that it should have found. And then, of the samples that were found, what fraction were correct. Now, here's the caveat with precision and recall. And it's not obvious until you fiddle with it for a while. Precision depends on recall. If I have 2% recall and 100% precision, that is totally meaningless because that means I got two things right out of the whole set and nothing wrong. But finding only two things of your whole set, 2%, is terrible. <laughs> so the precision number at that point is meaningless. Whereas if you have a pretty good recall, then you kind of trust your, your precision. So just remember that, because that's not intuitive, I think, at first when you first start working with it, but it's important. So sometimes you're like, Gosh, we had the best model ever. We're at 97% precision. I think it was like 15%. Actually, we didn't get much out of it. 
that may be okay for your application. If you're just literally trying to chop off false positives, maybe that's okay, but you usually want a little better support from your model in terms of recall. Um, some models where, you know, like you're doing something life-saving, you want recall to be really high. You don't want to miss anything, even if it means you have to take a hit in precision and have a little bit lower, uh, or if you accept some more false positives. Okay. Quick digression, so I'm going to use precision recall now, these super advanced techniques. No, these are pretty common. Most of you all know this stuff, I'm just talking. Um, to look. So, okay, yes, this is right, okay. So what do you notice here? So it gives me a precision recall for each label, which I really like. This is rock solid. My negatives are 95% precision, 85% recall. Like out of the box with five iterations or six iterations, I get a That's really good. And this isn't terrible. 16% precision, 97% recall. So what happened to my positives? 0.02% recall. That's bad. <laughs> so in case I wasn't clear, that's bad. Um, so like, so I started looking and saying. I'm still converging, so let's run a few more iterations and see what happens. And sure enough, the accuracy doesn't budge. I'm using again. I'm going to make it very clear. Um, so that means that I'm using my test set to see how well I'm doing on my optimization. Okay. So I should only use my validation set for that, but I'm, I'm cheating. Um, and just because I'm piloting a small model, so I'm using spur prototype, and I want to see how well things are looking before I go to the full data set. And I will not do that again. Okay, so here it gets worse, right? Now I've got zero recall and zero precision on my positive set. So obviously something is wrong with my model. So I went back, looked at my, my distributions, and I realized if you go back here, how much data is available? So I said, I'm just going to fix the data imbalance the easy way. I'm not going to do any crazy hacking. I'm going to, or crazy mathematical hacking. I'm going to just steal negative examples that are relevant from the Sentiment 140 data set, get that up to size, and then I'm going to just sam down sample the neutrals. So I built the data set, and I think I even gave you the add negative data notebook so you can build with that stuff. But it's not, it's not super. This is the one you probably want to try. So this loads the data that I fixed. Does it expanded? Um, that's the product data with a little bit of augmentation from uh, Sentiment 40. Here's the. Always remember to clean out your not molds. You don't want to get into your training, have it load everything, and then have it explode because you have one empty example in your, your data. Most of you are in this trick, so I'm just mentioning. But if we look at our distribution here now, I've got 32%, 33%. So why does it matter in a deep learning model how imbalanced my data is? Like if I've got just a few negatives, I should be able to figure that out in the long run, right? Any violent opinions on the matter? It's okay, kids be strongly now. Exactly, and where that where that becomes manifest is in the batch size. So if I have a batch size of 16, and I only have a handful of negatives, my first couple batches probably won't even have any. And you see that, you know, when I when I was doing my PyTorch model, um, you know, I was dumping out some of the the actual weights, and you can see as you're stepping along, I'm not getting any positive or not getting any negatives at all. There, are, everything was coming out super positive. And I realize it, it can overcome that, but it takes a long time. You have to run a lot of epochs just to get past that. So if I have an easy way to fix the imbalance, just do it. Don't, don't quibble and, and try to find the, the most awesome way. Because this is about text. This is not about balance. Now, we've had problems that we worked on 
um, in our work in digital reasoning, there are strongly imbalanced. You're talking about a few hundred positives per million negatives. So you can't just fix the imbalance by slapping out some more positives. Because, I mean, that's the real problem in the, in the data. And that, you know, we, we try a lot of crazy stuff to get that work. Um, okay, so where are we? So go back and run. This is the notebook you can run. So imbalance number two, go ahead and run through it. Um, I downsampled, and so what I did, I changed one other thing, because I realized I don't trust my validation set. I only have 80 examples in it. So I, I upsampled the training set to 1,400 and told it, OK, go ahead and take half of those, because it's cheap to calculate another validation, right? Whereas it's just expensive to do a lot more training. It's like, don't give it any more training data. Just give it a big validation set where I'm nice and comfortable that I have all of the labels nicely distributed in that 700 uh, sample. And that helped a lot too. So, simple things. Just kind of walking through how I think about this. Um, and there are better ways to think about it. I'm not guaranteeing that this is the, the best. Okay, so you see validation fraction, one half up here on the right. Write the model. And I uh, think that would look a lot more reasonable. So we start here with validation loss of 56. Um, or sorry, validation accuracy, 56, 52, 70. This is kind of where we got before, right? It was all 70 and it looked great, and then started going to 80, but the, uh, the test that accuracy didn't follow. So again, I'm only snooping here because I'm making a small pilot model. I'm not going to do it again. So, I mean, I'll do it again with this data, but I won't do it again when I do this model. Um, this is just to kind of help me see things. And the fact that I can't expose the validation set in for SQLint. Super frustrating. If I manage those sets myself, which I was doing in PyTorch, um, it's a lot easier. Then I can actually say, okay, what, what happened in the validation? I can do all the, you know, the, the precision recall breakdown on the labels in the PyTorch example and not have to do my little bit of snooping. So, also ran out of time to get the PyTorch example fully working, so that's it. Look and see what happens. This is a lot, a lot cleaner. Um, and this is a respectable model. I mean, just right out of the gate, the negatives are super strong. It makes me a little nervous, but, you know, with just four iterations, we're, we're in the range of, this isn't a fantastic model, but, you know, for, for prototypes, it's, it's a good start. We're getting above 70s, 67, 60s are weak, but 70s are strong. So let's try this one more time. Okay, so now I'm getting up to accuracy 73. And things are improving still. So I think I can I can run this more, but but I don't wanna I wanna make this something you could run in this time frame. And the challenge here for you is to take this as homework. Run this in Google Colab. It's real. Then you can use bigger starting data sets yourself. You can get there in a few minutes. And then you start getting those cool numbers you see like from the best that I have for AI courses, they're like, oh man, 37%. So you can't do that with a very small data set and a very little amount of time during iteration for the record. Um, but the whole point is reduce your iteration time so that you can iterate and you can you can try a lot of things. Okay, I left some stuff down here at the bottom. So what I'm gonna do, how much time do I have? Oh, 24 minutes left. How much time do we train something? Let me show you a couple things. If you're training this yourself, then what I would say is to take um, some, most of you are familiar with the SK Learn API. Once you have your model, you can do model, predict, and spell predict. And then you give it a list of examples. So make a little list of examples in Python, run that and print it, and you'll see the probabilities for positive, negative, and neutral for each of your examples. And that's one of the fun ways to test. Just make up a few words. Unfortunately, I killed this model, so I can't show you that right now. But you can see um, things work pretty well. I left a few things at the bottom there, like running it with bigger sequence lengths. Um, one of the things you want to do once you start getting beyond the hey, the little model is working is, OK, well, how, how am I doing with different parameters? Is, does the sequence length actually affect anything? Validate that yourself. Don't just make the assumption. So if you get the first thing on. OK. Okay, yeah, so this was my model diagnostics. And this was kind of the graphical 
So I showed you in the code how I found this, uh, this imbalance problem. And it's a lot more clear when you have your uh, learning curves, right? So here's my little snooping line. And you can see even though these look pretty nice, I've got my nice training loss that's slowly working its way down. I've got my validation loss that's slowly working its way down. Um, the test that I actually see didn't change. So that tells me something is amiss. And same thing up here. Oh, sorry, test set loss and the test set accuracy. So validation looks like it's getting better, but the test set accuracy isn't getting better. And the validation is getting better because there's so few examples in there. It just had 80 examples. So it's pretty easy to learn it. Um, OK, so this told me I was on the wrong track. So the learning curve is your friend. Always look at your learning curves. Now, there are a lot of, there are a lot of, uh, ideas, that works. A lot of ideas floating around about how to decide when to stop your training. So this is the technique we're looking at here is called early stopping. That's when I told you kind of your, your validation is going back and getting worse. That's called early stopping. You, you cut off the iteration. And the way you would normally do this is you run, actually run a lot of them and you just save a checkpoint at every so many iterations. You say, okay, I got to this far, go back and use number five or number seven or whatever. But you hear a lot of different criteria for when to stop. One thing that I've heard is look where the point where the training and validation loss cross each other. What do you think? Yay, nay. Anyone? Okay, there are two different sets of data, so the loss number doesn't actually have any meaning. They don't compare to each other at all. Don't do it that way. Um, number two, which I mentioned, is if the um, if things start getting worse. Well, loss is kind of a surrogate. Like, ideally, you'd like to see the accuracy getting worse before anything else. But the loss kind of, you know, it, it, it captures some of the same thing. And it's a decision within the machine learning of, of what decision it's going to make about how to move down through the, you know, through the mathematical space of making things better. But I think it's more reliable to to use the accuracy itself. So look for look for as model is getting worse in a way that makes sense to me. That's your best bet. And don't do this crossing stuff. Sure does. Okay. So if you're using accuracy, does that mean that you know that this the, the class labels in this are balanced? No, so that was one of the reasons I wanted to abandon BERT SKLearn because it has accuracy built in behind the nice little model.bit and I didn't want to do it that way. So, so why are you building di diagnostic curves off of accuracy instead of precision and recall? Because I didn't have the precision and recall data. So that was my, that's the glaring error here, which you have rightly called out. <laughs> Fair enough, thank you. Um, okay, so let's look. So if you want to understand something, I say, fiddle with it. So this is my, my learning rates network. So I took that model we just built and said, okay, how do we illustrate what's really going on with learning rates and what you actually see? Well, let's just try it. Let's try to turn up the learning rate and turn down the learning rate and see what we see. Okay, same data, haven't changed anything, same model, except for one thing create the model. I, in this first one, oh wait, that's the same one. I'm in the wrong one, sorry. Okay, this is the, yeah, okay, this is it. So the, this is the one that says learning rate, not the old or the second thing. Just when you keep those oddly named prior versions around, and you're sure when you make the backup, you're like, I don't remember what that means. You never do. So I might have thought is, if you, don't, if you don't use the prior version, like in the next hour, delete it so you don't, uh, you don't kick yourself later. Um, or make good notes. I didn't do either one. So I can't, I can't actually con uh, counsel you to do either. Okay, decrease the learning rate by 10 x. So we just turned it down um, two to the times 10 to the minus six right here, and what do you expect to see? Not little steps, not much progress. Um, 
And I think we kind of see that. You see the validation access needs going more slowly. I'll show you some plots in a minute. And we are getting, you know, like down here, you look at the, the precision recall. They're getting good, but just not getting there very fast, which is what we would expect. Okay, so validate your, uh, your, your intuition. Turn it up 10x. So now we've got 2 times 10 to the minus 4. And what happens? Well, it starts to bounce around. It doesn't blow up. If you turn it up a little more, it would explode and just, you know, keep getting there. We get worse and worse. But it's not getting better. You can see the training loss is, it goes up a little, it goes down a little. I only ran it for a few epochs because we took time. I'm doing this on a laptop. And um, you know, the validation loss is the same. It bounces up, bounces back down. It's not, it's not really progressing. And you see, you can see that with our, our little snooping tests here. Um, precision, 32% on the neutral label only. Everything else is nothing. This model will not converge. You can run it forever. And here are the plots. Here are the plots to prove it with three data points. Just kidding. Run it longer when you have your GPU. So this is, I, I would like to consider this like a homework intensive kind of tutorial. Go do the homework. Have fun with this stuff. NLP is fun. It's super easy to make data. Super easy to do new things with it. So here, you kind of see these are trending down, but in three epochs with the other model, I was already down here, right? I was, I was well into the 0.5 and below range. And then here, running rate times 10, I'm not going anywhere. Like, I'm well above one, and I'm just kind of floating up there. If you can derive a whole trend from three points, which some people are willing to do, um, and today, I would be willing to do that. That's not good practice. Okay, is anybody actually running the, the, that notebook with the, the other one? The imbalance 2, cleans up the imbalance, somebody try it. It's, it's cool. Um, let's go back to this. Alright, so I don't have a lot left, so let's open up for questions, comments, and let me put this up first. Interesting and relevant links. Number one, fast.ai. If you are really interested in doing this and, and doing it well, um, that is the best. It's free. I think what blows my mind is uh, Jeremy Howard and Rachel Thomas have created this course. It's free. It has a huge community. People are constantly improving the code, updating. You know, spend a couple weeks if you really want to be good at neural nets. The claim is, Jeremy Howard claims, if you do the practical deep learning for coders class, complete it, build the models, then you do the second one, the advanced practical learning for deep coders class, that you will be winning Kaggle competitions. He was number one on Kaggle for years, and he only quit when his students became number one on Kaggle. So he's got the he's got the results <laughs> to, to back his claims. So these are some fun things. Um, and I assume they're going to put the slides up. You can also email me. I'll show you on the next slide. You can super easy to remember my email. Um, you can also email me. I can send you whatever. And if you're interested in getting follow-ups like more notebook code, etc., please email me because I can always know when I post that stuff. And then um, we're not supposed to use this for advertising, so I won't. But uh, some good colleagues of mine contributed to this, or uh, wrote this book, fantastic book on deep learning for NLP and speech processing. That was not advertising, just information. <laughs> for an explanation, like how does it work, this is a great thorough explanation. I thought it was one of the best. Um, here's a tweet stance via transfer lines, kind of similar to what we're doing. Stance is a little different from sentiment, so what we're trying to do with sentiment and stance is kind of uh, sentiment with respect to something, like how do they stand on this particular uh, topic. The Illustrated Transformer. Uh, Jay Alomar has a, a blog where he breaks down these huge models and makes the best diagrams. So you can really follow how it works. Like, take all the guts out and say, okay, here's how the, um, you know, here's how the attention layers work, here's how the encoders work and the decoders, here's how the training works. Great diagram. Um, this is probably something to start with if you're really interested in trying to understand how it works. Diagonal learning rate of your neural network, this is good. Um, 
Tuning Bird was the fastest at AI library. I didn't try that one, but it looked cool, so I'm probably going to try that one. And then, just to show you, Google has really made it super easy to use everything. So, using a cloud um, tensor processing unit to run Google Bird, train it, you already have a collab notebook up and ready to go. You just have to set up your own little cloud node and say, okay, go off and, and do your thing. Um, anyway, some, some fun, interesting things. Um, all right, questions. Questions, comments, concerns. I thought this was going to be more technical, less technical. Yes. data science that you would do up front to say, okay, well, let's try these different model parameters on different you know, different settings and see how well the model does. Once you've gotten past this pilot model, so call it, you're sure you can run stuff through, you're sure it's doing what it's supposed to be doing, then you put that in a bigger framework and say, okay, well, I want to check for, okay, what if I set different sequence lengths? What if I set different, you know, uh, necessarily different only because it's so critical, but you kind of get the sense of what I'm talking about. There are a lot of yeah, so then you then you have a, uh, some tools like Google Vizier or MLflow that just go out and try them all and give you back reports. Okay, well this is a good one and this is a good one. This is a good way to do it. And so you don't want to really spend a lot of time exploring that space yourself because it's gigantic. You're gonna you're gonna try all these little branches. You're gonna prune some. And they're gonna... Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so the question was, should I get this right? Number one, what have I observed in sentiment in particular, like being able to predict sentiment on whatever? Um, how how we've seen that get better over time? Have I seen that myself? And then, sorry, part two was... Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, so definitely it, it's gotten better. So lots of, um, just by numbers, they, there was a uh, there's a recent a recent in the, the fast.ai forum you have a bunch of uh, very um, energetic and motivated machine learning developers and researchers and so Jeremy Howard the you know, the kind of de facto leader of this, this uh, plan uh, posted uh, or someone posted a challenge to him on Twitter it was uh, Rada Mil Milse I'm not sure how to pronounce her name she said look Naive Bayes still wins in sentiment on these benchmark data sets. And um, he said, uh, he said, guys, we think this is a challenge. <laughs> We're going to beat this. So the, the, as a community, they all jumped in. And they've got the new state of the art. But the numbers are, you know, over time, you see the numbers change. It's not like, you know, 60%, 70%. I mean, you're looking at like 90 plus, where you're going to get a handful of things wrong in a well-tuned sentiment model. So it's not like, Okay, maybe one out of four. It's like you know, one or two out of a hundred, which is that, that really steps you into the realm of being able to say I can use this for a product. You know, when you're starting to get up in the high 90s, you know, then people can interact with it and, and the results are meaningful. But when there are a lot of errors, you kind of have to explain it away. Well, you know, it gets it wrong a quarter of the time. So that kind of answers the first question. So then, this very exact thing. The solution they used to beat that state of the art was transfer learning. So there's a another model that they created called ULM Fit, and it's the same kind of idea. It's not trained the same way as BERT, but you just download this model and start fine tuning and get your, you know, and then do all the crazy little parameter tricks to get things really tight. And so one of the one of the fast.ai folks beat the state of the art and published, okay, this is now the state of the art. We're, you know, we're winning this. So. It's fun. I mean, there, there's this big community. It's competitive. They, you know, and I think that's one of the big things that's driven so much. It's not just Facebook versus Microsoft versus you know, Allen AI versus OpenAI. 
some big organizations with a lot of resources are really putting some, you know, putting some time into this. So one of the big steps we've seen recently, which is exciting, is the big step down in model size. So Bird is big, a couple of gigs. And recently there was a paper published from Google about how to distill that in a much smaller model. And two days later, the, the PyTorch Transformers folks had that model in their repo and said, look, okay, here's all the scripts to distill it. It's, I mean, it's just mind-boggling. I don't have to hire a bunch of people to write this code and figure out if it works. Download it, try it, you know. And, and that's one of the things that we've been trying to shift in our mindset. We just feel like we need so fast. You don't really have the time to sit down and do it all yourself from scratch. Try stuff, pull it down, then figure out how it works. If it looks promising, figure out how it works, but try it first. It's there. Models are there. Code is there. Just do it. Start thinking that way. See what you can find on GitHub first. And there are a bunch of people who are just hobbyists who are getting great results with open source models and tools, which is amazing. All this is mind boggling. If you back up to like the digital reasoning started, they were a very niche company doing a very niche thing, and no one else was doing it. And now everybody's doing it. You know, so it's it's harder not to stay there. That's that's our challenge. So does that answer your question? Yeah, so you, you sure, I mean, you can do some waiting. You know that, you know kind of how much big data you put in there. <laughs> but then there, I mean, so these models are also super flexible. You can just, you can just train past it. And you can say, look, just start with the imbalance data and let it run for a long time. And you kind of get warmed up and it gets past the fact that it hasn't seen all the labels it needs to see. It has seen them all now. And it knows it's going to see them in kind of lower frequencies, but it'll, it'll learn the right distribution. And that's kind of what I found here was when I started, it would get past it, but I really wanted to do this in a way that hopefully somebody could try to do this during the tutorial. Um, and it would be, it would get done. <laughs> so, so I thought, okay, the better solution is to actually just force the balance. Does that, does that kind of answer your question? We have the time? So please contact me if you're interested in kind of follow-up information. You're trying to learn on your own. Send me an email. I will get back to you.